I was going to see a few people have already commented in the chat and I thought, well, is anyone going to rock up tonight? Because it's a bit different. Like last week we were talking about how uh, we could build a portfolio and we went through um, anti-fragile companies. Or sorry, it was the week before we went through building a portfolio, then anti-fragile companies and where I'd invest $10,000 and all this sort of stuff. And I thought this week, let's take a bit of a backward step. Let's talk about something that is more profound, but probably less clickbaity. And yet here we all are talking about uh, investing in this way. And fortunately, if you've come for the juicy stuff, um, I did get asked a question today on Twitter, whether you should use VDHG as a portfolio solution or just roll your own, um, make your own portfolio, in other words. Um, so we'll get to that. And I'll also have some time for questions tonight, which have been lovely. You may remember that we did the ETF mini series and we'll be gearing up. We are gearing up for a value investing series next month. So these next couple of weeks are a bit more just different topics, things I'd love to explore with you. Um, so Rob's just put something in the chat. Rob from Selfwealth says, a uh, little poll to shake out any nod subscribers. Hitting that subscribe button will be a huge help. Thanks for sharing that, Rob, in the chat there. That's wonderful. Uh, Chef Circu said, watched Owen's interview with Todd Barlow. It was great. Not oh, fantastic. Good evening, Simon. Um, Martin says, Portfolio moving sideways mostly. Soul pats and brickworks are still moving upwards. CSL is grinding away. Isn't it just? Um, Owen says, yep, yeah, but the portfolio took a hit this week, but it's expanded to over 6% deviation from the index since November. I'll take that. Well, I think when you say deviation, I think you mean outperforming, like deviating in the good way, uh, I assume, which is great. Uh, good evening, Jenny, everyone. Denise, welcome, Jason. Okay, nearly breaking through 10,000 subscribers, Jason says. Yes, indeed. And self wealth lot. So um, that's great. Hey, I'm going to try some new um, new software tonight. Uh, I'm going to try and present to you in a in a different way using a different piece of software. This is actually Canva, uh, the Aussie startup is taking over from my Google Slides. Um, and while I was going through some of my old Google Slides, actually, before we get to this week's joke, I was actually looking back to the old slide deck that had over 300 slides in it that we covered. I think it was last year, and I was looking back in time. And you might remember we covered a lesson uh, around about, I, I, I think it would have been the middle of last year. I don't know for sure, because all it says is like, it's only got the timestamps on it. But w whenever this headline was written, China plans to annex Taiwan. Let's try and find that. The Guardian, China plans, plans to annex Taiwan. And the reason I bring this up, okay, so that was in October 2022. Okay. So let's just have a quick look. And I'm, I haven't planned any of this in advance, by the way. October 2022. Well, that was around about here. i got to admit, I'm pretty happy with that market timing. You know we don't talk about market timing much here on the show because I'm a non-believer. Non but uh, since then, it's gone pretty well. And uh, uh, I got a message today about zero going pretty well recently as well. Uh, the last three-month chart, obviously, I don't look at the short term, but uh, very happy with that. Uh, I own shares in zero, of course. Um, so anyway, I just thought, you know what? When I was putting these together, there were so many scary headlines last year. And I gave you seven reasons why maybe uh, the market could rebound. The Ukraine war is definitely not resolved. Uh, China tensions maybe have cooled. Um, earnings don't fall as quickly as people expect. Uh, inflation slows quicker than expected, probably in line with the expectation. Interest rate increases slow down. That's happened. Uh, US dollar cools down, or not really. Uh, and the dividend yield uh, sentiment improves. We've definitely seen an increase in sentiment. So anyway, I just thought that we would uh, just reflect on some of those things from last year, not to butter our own bread, but just to remind ourselves that uh, even in the worst of times, things can look up. In fact, normally they do. Um, so, oh, yes, I was showing the wrong thing. Um, I went a bit fuzzy out of focus. I believe he's lost in the source. I was on a different screen. I will show you something different. One, one second. So I'll show you what I was looking at. Um, that's silly because I've tried this new software. It's kind of caught me off guard. Okay, so uh, the, so the things that I was looking at was I was looking at this uh, article, which I referenced all the way back in October last year. Um, and looking at the different reasons why the stock market could rebound, right? And then I looked at this, which showed this is ASX 200 here in Australia. So it was right around here we did this presentation and things have gone pretty well. 
and uh, said to me today that zero has done pretty well. I hadn't noticed. I actually don't check the share price. I probably only check the share price of my companies once a year, maybe um, more only when I look at um, what's going on here. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I just thought it would be interesting because as I was going back through our old slides, I was thinking, well, that looks pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Okay, on with tonight's joke, the most important part of tonight's self Worth live session. This is uh, uh, from Dad Says Jokes, of course, and it says the perfect father gift doesn't ex And they stop themselves and they show a picture of a T-shirt that says, why did the chicken go to the gym to work on his pecs? And that's my joke. That's my dad joke. This comes courtesy of Dad Says Jokes. As always, I know we all love them. That's probably a nine out of 10, I'd reckon. Uh, but as always, uh, we've get to the piece that uh, I know that Rob and I get really excited about, which is this uh, disclaimer. And tonight I've just done an action shot from a podcast that we recorded recently. Don't know why this image, but it was there. And I thought, well, that's nicer, nice back, black background. So just to read off the disclaimer, the self wealth live videos contain general financial advice only. It means the information or advice that does not take into account your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should not act on the information until you have spoken to a licensed and trusted planner. My name is Owen Rask, and I'm the founder and director of the Rask Group. You can see we've got a company number there, and we're a corporate authorized representative, 1280930 of Waddle Partners. And there's an AFSL 383169, which you can look up in the Money Smart website or ASIC website. Please refer to the Rask Group's financial services guide if you're confused about what any of this means. Finally, the views expressed in the live streams are solely those of myself and or guests and do not necessarily reflect the opinions or views of SelfWealth. And that is it. Um, who is this handsome dude, says Chef Circle? Well, I don't know. Just some guy. It looks like he's daydreaming, to be honest. Um, okay. So I've got a few uh, things that I want to get through tonight, and I would love it if you have either a better lesson to be learned or maybe you can quote or something like this. But um, I put together 10 things, and I'll just bring it back to me for a second. I This afternoon... I, I thought to myself, what can we talk about tonight that's going to hopefully be a, somewhat profound? And I got, I went to my bookshelf uh, in the other room and I grabbed off some books that have a, had a really profound impact on me. Uh, and there's heaps more just down off the side here. There's like little books like this one, uh, heaps of other books. I'm surrounded by books, actually. There's about 20 on my desk at the moment. And I keep them handy because I just like to pick them up and flick through the the parts of the book that really stood out to me. And what I like to do is I do the, the reverse dog ears where I put like a little mark on each of the corners and uh, I can remember them and come back to them. And uh, one of the things that you might've seen in the self wealth email tonight was this idea of he who is taught only by himself has a fool for a master. And that kind of sets the scene for the conversation tonight. So investing, one of the first things that ever got taught to me and it was brought up again in the very first interview I ever did on our podcast. So, you know, no, if you follow the RAS brand, we've done five or 600 podcasts now. And uh, we interview some of the best investors in the country and some of the best financial thinkers, I, I'm very humbled to say, in the world. And the very first interview was with a guy called Wayne Peters, who had been investing for 25 years or so, I think, by that stage. And he said, the one thing you need in investing is curiosity. You need curiosity. Because understanding investing is basically trying to understand the world. You're understanding why businesses do what they do. And businesses are just groups of people that come together to try and solve a problem. And if that problem is important enough, uh, people will pay for it. You will forego some of your money or time or effort, and you will pay someone something in exchange for the value that they create. And so in effect, investing, if you are a long-term investor like me and not so much like a day trader who doesn't really care about this stuff, but if you are a long-term investor, what you're trying to do is you're trying to understand the world. And that's what I think makes investing so interesting. People think that because I'm an analyst, I actually just sit around looking at spreadsheets all day. I actually couldn't tell you the last time I was crunching numbers uh, like that. So um, I can see a question, which oh, amazing disclaimer actually just took my eyes right across the screen. Harry Warner saying amazing disclaimer, 10 out of 10, simply wow. Unbelievable. Um, and Sparky, you say he is married in response to Chef Circle saying that this is a handsome dude. And Paul's given us 11 out of 10. Uh, there was a question um, from, I think it was dollar cost averaging into Sol Pattinson. Uh, Sol Pattinson is the company that we talked about last week with Todd Milner. Uh, 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 sorry, with, with Todd, um, not Todd Milner, uh, with Todd Barlow um, and him being the CEO. 
I, I think you could dollar cost average into a company like that. Uh, it's obviously not personal advice, but I, I, I would. That's how I'm treating it anyway. Um, and that's a good one. So hi, you've said it needs to be patient. It pays to be patient. I think that's a great one, and I'll come up back to that in just a minute. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I sometimes feel like a stalker when a company catches my interest, says Fleur. Yes. Uh, so late, Jeremy. No, you're not. You're just on the first slide. We're just on the first slide. So it's all good. So in summary, this idea of some investors go through life thinking that one, they don't need to read, two, they don't need to learn, and three, they don't need to listen a bit to what other investors have said. And you may remember that last year, I think it was, I introduced you guys to this idea of a humility curve. And if you imagine that you have complexity, like the difficulty in your investing going up one side of this chart and you've got time going left to right, basically people start off investing very simple. They buy this thing that they know and they kind of stick with it. They read like a beginner investing book and then they get more and more complicated until they start losing money and then they come back down the other end. And fortunately, thanks to things like ETFs and financial education and these types of transparent, uh, honest forms of kind of investing, people are moving from this area across to this area far quicker than ever before. I think most people need to lose money in order to understand investing. In fact, I say everyone does. But the quicker you can move from this point to this point, the better. Uh, and this is where the idea of reading and learning from the mistakes and successes of other people is really important. So um, Paige, uh, my second one is actually a really interesting one. So this is one that's only really changed my life in the last few years. And I've actually got an activity that we can all do tonight on this because Rob said to me uh, last week, he said, the more activities we can do as a community, the better. And you will find in the description, so in the text of this video, you will find a link to this PDF that you can download and you can do with yourself uh, or your family members or friends or whatever. But the quote is this, you've got to be very careful if you don't know where you are going because you might not get there. Does anyone know where this quote comes from? Um, just comment in the chat. I don't know, you'll get a digital high five, like a bit of a crisp high five from me. But this quote, you can Google it, or you can just, if you know it off the top of your head, just paste it in the chat. This quote is an idea that most people, when they set about investing, they actually set goals. And I'll come back to those in a minute. Um, the Bible says, Harry, uh, I'm not sure if it's in the Bible, actually. I haven't read it to cover to cover, but uh, it doesn't come from that. It comes from someone else. Um, and the idea is many people, when they set about investing in the stock market, what they typically do is they jump straight to what should I invest in? And they forget the first and most important step, which is why am I investing? And a lot of people, and I'll share with you why I'm investing in just a moment, I actually share some very personal things in just a minute. But a lot of people jump straight to what should I invest in? They don't think about, well, why am I doing this? Most people have a general idea. It's like investing, something like this. Uh, it's giving me Alice in Wonderland vibes, says Rob. It's not that. That's got to be Buffett, says Jason, or Buffet with one T. Um, uh, Jeremy said, I really like your statement of starting an investment is a three-year apprenticeship. I resemble that comment, Owen. Hashtag getting better. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll share you all the misery of trying to pick out what this one is. But this is actually from Yogi Berra. And the quote, obviously very uh, crafty with the turn of phrase, uh, the quote is basically that if you don't have a goal or an aim or a destination in mind, you will never be satisfied because you may never reach the thing that you don't know what you're going for. Um, uh, RBA board extraordinaire Drew Meredith, perhaps, says Harry. Maybe, maybe. Actually, there is a quote from Andrew Derrimuth coming up today. Yogi Berra says, Danica, you got it. Okay. So in the chat, in the discussion, oh, sorry, not in discussion, in the, um, the description for this video, below it, you will find this activity that we do at RASC with all of our students. And uh, it comes from Ramit Sethi, who currently has that Netflix documentary on, or Netflix series on uh, helping couples and in, in relationships and their relationship with money. I can't remember. It was like, teach you to be rich or your rich life or something like this. Anyway. You may have heard me talk about this once or twice before, but this is a very simple activity and you can see it's just on one piece of paper and you don't even need to use this piece of paper. You can just do it on anything, on the document in front of you, on a, the back of a book, whatever you want to do. Maybe don't deface it. Um, what are the 10 things you value the most in your life? That's just put them down in this column right here. Another way to think about this is what are the 10 things that bring you the most joy? So what brings you happiness in life? And in this other column, you would write down the 10 things you spend the most money on. 
You could also do it for time, by the way, but money in this instance. What are the 10 things that you spend the most time on? What are the 10 things you spend the most money on? You put them in this column. Now, a lot of people find when they do this activity, they might spend, never mind the type, uh, the grammatical error here, they might find that they spend a lot of money on their mortgage or their groceries, or they might find something like this. And that's completely fair. That's pretty normal. Uh, and you can't really change that. But sometimes people put things in this column, things like I spend a lot of my money on my car loan repayments. I spend a lot of money on uh, my boat or I spend a lot of money on shopping. And then in this column, they realize that shopping is not in the top five. It's probably not even in the top 10 or if it is, maybe it's down at number nine. Or maybe they find that their car and the value that they get from their car is actually 10. And so if you're spending the third amount of money up here on a car loan repayment, but you get no joy from it, that's a clear mistake in the way you're living your life financially. I was actually driving home from the cafe this morning and I was actually thinking to myself, am I crazy for loving how terrible my car is? Like, I love that it's crap. I actually love that it's not very good because I can drive it anywhere. And I don't really care about it. If something goes wrong with it, I don't really care. And I don't really think about it. As long as it gets me from A to B, it's reliable. Who cares? Scratches, doesn't matter. But yet most people spend a lot of time thinking about the car. But I think most people, if they actually ask themselves, don't get a lot of value from the car that they have. Um, and so that's probably one of the things that I'd say. So Chef, you've said taxes and drugs. Those are, I, I'm assuming that those are the two things that you get the most joy from. Taxes being first and drugs second and not what you spend the most money on. Thank you. Um, so uh, boat, uh, better bring out another thousand. Um, so I think this is the thing, like, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Well, that's interesting, Vaughn. That's very interesting. I do like that uh, turn there you've given me. Um, it will indeed. But oftentimes what happens is those roads that you go down, uh, Vaughn, I, I find are the very short-term roads. So we experiment with things and we go in, down 10 different roads and we end up just going around in circles. Um, uh, okay. I know this is a silly question to ask, Jeremy says, but Andrew Derrimuth is Drew's alter ego. That is correct. That is correct. Um, we're trying to get Andrew Derrimuth on um, Bloomberg and he may even run for the RBA board, but he's actually a fictitious person. So we're trying to create this alter ego in the Australian financial ecosystem and get this financial person who no one knows who they truly are and try to get them quoted in the most prominent financial publications in the country. So this is a work in progress. And if Bloomberg, if you're watching Andrew Derrimuth, Dr. Andrew Derrimuth Esquire is actually available for comment. So um, that's uh, that's something that uh, we can work on as an aside. Anyway, I would love if you do take some time to sit down and do this activity. I've done it. But what I realized in my, and you can see in the background here, you can actually see my own vision board. And this is another activity that we do where we go through people and we say, we basically get you to do a thumbs up or thumbs down. And so what we would get you to do is on a piece of paper, we just get you to, if you don't know where you're headed in life and you don't know what you truly value and you feel lost, and a lot of people do, what we get you to do is we get you to do thumbs up or thumbs down, basically. And we say, what are the things that you like and what are the things that you dislike? And you might just find that, like, I like fresh air. I don't like pollution. I like animals. I don't like uh, big groups. I like this. I like, I don't like that. I like ice cream. I don't like pasta, whatever it might be. And what we do is we get you to go through this very trivial exercise. And that is the basis of building who you are in the financial plan. Um, and when I say financial plan, I mean this in an ad hoc way because a lot of people can't access financial advice. So what are the tools and the strategies that we can use in a general way to help you do it yourself? And so that's um, one of the things that we focus on and how you can start from the very basics. And you can see on mine here, because I've done this exercise. You can see that I really value work-life balance. I want to go to Europe, have some kids. I want to do a renovation. I'd love to build a $5 million business. Um, I want to buy a farm and I want to live on the farm. But you can also see that I've bucketed it by decades of my life, or in this case, five years, because I want to also put a time frame on this to move towards it. Uh, and I'll get to why this is important in just a minute. So someone before mentioned uh, compounding. I can't remember who it was. G'day, Stevie. Um, um, one of the quotes that I got really early on in 
um, my journey as an investor and as someone who thinks about educating other people in money is this fantastic quote. And I can't remember the origin. I should have looked it up before tonight, but I got it from a guy called Tony Hansen. And he said, the chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too heavy to be broken. And this is this idea that people tend to move through life and maybe in their investment portfolio, just doing the same old things. Imagine, for example, and Rob and I were both very lucky to speak at the Australian Shareholders Association last week in Sydney. And a lot of people that attend the ASA event are probably in their 50s or 60s, it's fair to say, maybe even older 70s. And imagine people that started investing 50 years ago. Uh, these people typically know stocks and they may even use a broker that they go and see in person and do the transaction or give them a call on the phone. Then along came, you know, online brokerage, like where self-wealth is and ETFs. But imagine if you just moved through your investing and never really took notice of those things that are important. Sometimes these habits can work against us and sometimes they can work for us. Many people will know that even though I say things like goals-based investing is really important, I actually think it's easier and less overwhelming for people to focus on smaller goals. And by that, I mean forming habits rather than pie in the sky goals. Because most people, I think the average New Year's resolution fails by the 20th of, the, of January or something like that. And I think one of the big reasons that people do that is they're not specific enough. And one of the easiest ways to do it, for example, is to go back and to look at the goal that you have or the idea or the value that you're trying to work towards and to chunk it down, to break it down into smaller pieces. So this could be like monthly or quarterly goals. Um, and a lot of people don't do this, but one of the easiest things that you can do is you can actually just use automation. So you can transfer a thousand bucks in your self-wealth account each and every month, 10,000, whatever, reinvest your dividends, automatically have your bank account set up so that they do um, be paid. Like my business automatically pays a tax bill every month, even though I don't know the tax bill. So I don't know exactly what it will be, but my bank accounts are automatically set up to split a certain percentage of income in straight to the ATO. So that by the time June 30 rolls around for the business, there's no like bill shock. Um, my personal account is set up so that when I get paid, it automatically transfers the money away. Now, this is a kind of a way to sidestep some of these habit formations, but it's actually a way to automate a lot of that and get that out of my mind and focus on the things that matter. Um, uh, Penny, you've said, as an aside, I love the way you do your disclaimer so much that I have copied the style for two webinars I ran last week. It was in relation to legal advice. Thank you for the inspiration. Well, Penny, I would just love to see your disclaimer. Maybe by the end of this year, we can all get together and we can just do one big disclaimer uh, presentation and everyone can take the turns. Um, uh, Rajan, you've said, hi, Owen, joining live after a few. I think after a few, I don't know if you mean, oh, you said few months. I wasn't sure in in some uh, generations, joining after a few in Australia might be joining after a few beers or something like this. Uh, but I'm glad you're joining after a few months and uh, you regularly listen to the Wednesday briefs and love them. Fantastic. Um, the best habit book, Penny says, is Atomic Habits by James Clear. Couldn't agree more. Love it. Absolutely love it, Penny. Love it. Yeah, absolutely great book. Um, James Clear, I think it was James Clear, yes, recently did a, uh, a three-hour interview with um, Tim Ferriss. Absolutely outstanding interview. Um, different point of view. How do you feel about the modern safety features of a car, especially if it is a family member that primarily drives it? Uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm qualified to give that, give that advice, Stevie. Um, but anyway, I look for little wins that can compound over time. So this might be dollar cost averaging, which we know works. Um, another thing, you know, there was there's this belief that it takes about six weeks to form a good habit, like paying off a credit card, exercising, so on and so forth. But there's more evidence emerging now that it's not actually about the time that it takes to form a habit. It's actually the feeling that you get from practicing that, that thing. So if you feel good about doing the thing, it's more likely to turn into a habit. Um, and what this touches on right here is this idea that most people, when it comes to building their share portfolio, building their ETF portfolio, don't actually think that they're making any progress until one day those chains of habit have created a monster. I remember um, when I was chatting to Glenn James, the founder of My Millennial Money last year, it was a fantastic discussion. Um, we both agreed that the first $100,000 in your portfolio most of that is going to come from the amount that you save. So there's like Warren, uh, Charlie Munger says this idea of like the first million is the hardest. Of course it is. Uh, but 
Glenn and I were talking about the first hundred thousand dollars in your share portfolio or ETF portfolio will be based on how much you can save. But after that, every extra hundred thousand dollars will not be because of the amount that you save, typically, unless you somehow earn millions of dollars over the next few years. But typically what we see is more people making better investment choices and making better decisions over time. And that's where the effects of compounding. And at $100,000, a 4% dividend is four grand. So it's very noticeable. On $10,000, 400 bucks is not nearly as noticeable, especially if it's split up over you know six months. So um, um, I just got Atomic Habits, says Robert, looking forward to reading it. Yeah, it's a great one. Um, <laughs> BB says, I'm joining after a few clink clink. <laughs> Uh, I like that. Thank you very much for making me smile. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, Jeremy, you said, uh, I'm looking at my brokerage account too much. I know I shouldn't, but any chance of a poll for everyone to say how often they look at their brokerage account might make me feel better. I know Owen looks at his a few times a year. Yeah, I, so I should clarify, Jeremy, I don't typically look at the the share my share portfolio every day. In fact, probably not even every week. But I do look at share prices occasionally through things like Google uh, or, on my, or on my phone, like when I'm just looking at things generally. But I don't actually log into my brokerage account each and every day because I don't want to put myself in front of that where I might make a choice or a decision that I regret longer term. And I'll get to that in a minute. So number four, lesson number four that I learned is remarkable how much long-term advantage people like us have gotten by trying to be consistently not stupid instead of trying to be very intelligent. Now, this is a very convoluted quote, but if anyone knows where it comes from, uh, extra points to you. So maybe uh, any of the quotes that I come up tonight, if you can guess where it came from, I'll give you a, a crisp digital uh, bit of praise. Uh, but this is this idea, and it's this idea that I'll give you an analogy. All right. So, so in tennis, uh, and this is the best example that comes from Shane Parrish. In tennis, in professional tennis, there's a belief that 80% of the points are won, meaning that when you're a professional tennis player like N Rafael Nadal or, um, I don't know, Roger Federer back in the day, something like this, you have to beat your opponent. However, in amateur tennis, where people like me pick up a racket and think we can hit a tennis ball over a net and it will go, somehow go in the court. In amateur tennis, 80% of the points are lost. So think about that for a minute. In professional tennis, you've got to win. However, in amateur tennis, and I would say I'm an amateur investor and we're all amateur investors, it's actually not losing that makes you win. And Scott Phillips, my old mentor at The Motley Fool said, um, he had this one message, very, he's very good um, in short form messages, Scott. And he said to me, Oh, and I'm convinced that successful investing is more to do with the mistakes you avoid than the successes that you achieve. Um, and Pat Dorsey, who is, was the previous head of Morningstar's research and went on to form Dorsey Asset Management and wrote the book, which I do not have here in front of me. Um, I think it's the little book of common sense investing. I think that's it. Um, but he, he's written a few. Anyway, he talks about this idea of the tennis players and how if you have a professional tennis player versus an amateur, the amateur should only just focus on getting the ball back. And by doing that, they probably have a pretty good game. Whereas the professional must win. So they must try uh, their hardest. Uh, and so I can see some things here, which I'll just re respond to. So Aaron, you've got it correct. Uh, that quote actually comes from Charlie Munger. So it is remarkable how much long-term advantage he says, by being consistently not stupid than trying to be very intelligent. And this idea that it's easier to avoid stupidity than it is to seek brilliance. That's kind of the summary version, the cliff notes of the quote. Um, so that's that's definitely uh, something. So, Rob, I think you've got the poll up. I'm actually just going to bring this up uh, on my screen because I don't actually always see the live video, guys. I see the other side of the video. So I'm actually just going to quickly... Uh, bring this up so I can see the poll uh, and I can I can vote on it because that's important to me too. Um, so I'll just get rid of that. Okay, so I can see the poll. How often do you look at your brokerage account in a week? Okay, so someone said one. Um, 
one one time a week, which is great. So a few people have said that actually, which is great. A lot of people up around the six to 10 or even up to 20, 20 times a week. I definitely do not check my portfolio 20 times a week, which uh, I did in the beginning. I definitely did in the beginning. If we go back a bit to when I was in this phase of my investing, I definitely checked it regularly. Uh, in two, probably even up to a hundred times a week, to be honest. But I was also like working in the industry, but I was definitely checking it a hundred times a probably a week, maybe twenty times a day, thirty times a day, something like that. Um, what is the secret side of the video? <laughs> There's no real secret side. I just see the back end of the live version. I don't get to see the polls, unfortunately, Jeremy. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, just in the interest of time. So another thing that comes from Charlie Munger. He's the only person that features twice in this list, by the way. Um, but invert, always invert. And oftentimes what we find in investing, like I'm here tonight with you guys talking about the virtues of ETF investing, keeping it simple, investing for the long term. I couldn't tell you how many people in my industry who are professionals disagree with me. I couldn't tell you how many people would say I'm wrong. Long-term investing doesn't work. You sh none of that stuff works. This is what you should do. What I always try to do as someone who is an interviewer and someone who's trying to learn is, there's this Hans Rosling concept, and you may remember Hans Rosling. He wrote the book Factfulness. He's a medical doctor who um, just is a fantastic individual and it, uh, started the website called Gapminder. Um, but anyway, he has this idea that you can ask someone to know if you're trying, like if you're in a, in a debate with someone, say about a stock or an ETF or someone who doesn't agree with you on anything, you can say, what facts or data would make you change your mind? So you're not trying to change their mind for them. And just by prompting them to think, to invert their own logic, oftentimes they change their mind. Um, but there is one thing that happens here. And this is another quote from Hans Rosling that says, there's no room for facts when our minds are occupied by fear. And this is a very bad recipe for investors because as we saw before, um, if we went back to when like October last year, when things were really scary for investors and probably all of us, there's nuclear strikes talking about this. There was China and Taiwan. There was this, that, and the other. Um, and when your mind is occupied by this fear and you feed into it, you're less likely to be drawn to the rational side of investing, which is a major issue because as we know, the rational side of investing, the facts-based investing is actually incredibly positive. So the long-term outcomes of investing are actually incredibly positive. I'm trying to bring up my chart here. Uh, I don't know where it is, uh, but I was going to show you the long-term returns of the stock market. Um, it's actually incredibly positive, yet we can't rationalize those positive aspects of investing when we're consumed by fear. And the media knows that. That's why we tend to avoid it. Um, Richard Feynman says, Aaron, very close, um, Aaron, very close. I think Feynman has a few quotes along this line and I can't remember the exact, his exact phrases off the top of my head, but uh, this is fantastic. Uh, Aaron, you probably know this on Twitter, uh, Richard Feynman, who was a, a nuclear physicist um, and just a, a great person, personality overall and teacher. Um, there's actually a, a Twitter bot on, I think it's called the Feynman bot or something and it's on Twitter. And if you just tweet to it or you follow it, it'll actually come back with like, Richard Feynman quotes, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so I, Rob says, I checked my broker 20, more than 20 times, but in defense, I work for a brokerage for my brokerage account. This is true. This is true. You do too. Okay. So here's another thing that really changed the way I invest. And it's on average, there has been a market correction every year since the year 1900. However, only one in five of those turn into a bear market crash. Um, and that's a default. I mean, these figures are pretty loose, but a 20% fall. So uh, a correction is typically a 10% fall. Uh, a market crash is a 20% fall. And this comes from Tony Robbins, and he wrote the book Unshakable, and he has a few different sources. Some of them maybe are a bit, even though his book's unshakable, maybe a bit shaky in some of the data sources. I couldn't find them exactly. So what this idea tells me is that the stock market is great, but sometimes bad things happen. And sometimes, bad things turn into worse things. And there's this idea that um, there's, there's this really interesting idea where you turn this phrase around and you can say that things can be bad and better at the same time. So what that means is things can be bad and getting better. Number six is not 
um, Peter Lynch. Aaron, it's a great guess. Thank you for the guess. I really do appreciate you guessing. If anyone else has any guesses as these come up, please let me know. Um, and so this one was from Tony Robbins. And this is a this is a fantastic thing because it reminds you that on average, the stock market works on average, but not every year. And that's why you need a long-term perspective because if your thesis and your strategy is to buy one year and sell the next, it's probably not going to work. Um <laughs> Rob, after listening to Owen for ages, what's your favorite or most boring ETF investment? Um, I know one ETF that Rob bought and I'll spare him. I'll let him explain it if he wants to bring it up, but um, love for you to put that in the chat, Rob. Okay, so this is just a more an illustration that sometimes bad things happen. And I got an updated version of the chart that you all know. Um, and this chart, if I can zoom in, this chart you may remember shows 122 years of the stock market. So this is just trying to add evidence to what I was just saying. And you can see here that, you know, four out of five years are positive. And only a few of those years from basically here back are really bad. Maybe from this point back are really bad. But on average, the market tends to sit around 13% per annum. This is over the very long term. Maybe over the last 30 years, you could say 10% per annum. Uh, and sometimes bad things happen, right? And sometimes they don't. Um, but on average, long-term investors tend to win. And that's why I am a long-term investor. So it's as simple as that. Uh, Rob said, the first stock that I bought was Self-Wealth. And then I went with Fortescue. Oh, interesting. Fortescue, a company we haven't covered on the program that much. Um, I almost bought some myself. Sure, glad I didn't. I was thinking of that one too, Rob. Um, so Owen, you're saying... Uh, so. What do we got here? So Rob, you said uh, dr drunken Owen or drunken Miller. Uh, that's a good one, Mike. So uh, here we go. Rob, you said your first uh, ETF. You're going with Crip, aren't you? And that, that's what I was talking about. Um, but no, my main ETFs are A200 and NDQ. Ah, two beta shares ETFs are up. Cool. Uh, Jenny, you said, I may be wrong, but didn't Tony Robbins rip off a whole lot of people? Maybe, maybe, Jenny. He's written a lot of books. Um, I was actually watching some skit about him the other day, actually. Um, I'm waiting for my favorite Mark Twain quote. I don't actually have a Mark Twain quote in here, uh, Jeremy, but if you know, if you want to share one with me, I'm all ears. Uh, Owen, you said, my first e ETF is STW. That's the kid's primary core ETF and long-term, it's hammered along. That's fantastic. Okay, so I'll move to the next one. You may have seen this quote today in the, the self-wealth uh, email or even the RASC email. That 99% of long-term investing is doing no nothing. The other 1% will change your life. Now, I was thinking of doing like a chart here where you could see every day of the year going forward. What this basically implies is that only three days of the year is when you typically need to act. Now, in that original article, and I, do I have it here? In the original article that Morgan wrote, this is Morgan Housel, the author of Psychology of Money, by the way, probably the world's maybe one of the world's most recognizable authors on financial and investment matters nowadays and behavioral finance in particular. Uh, fantastic, fantastic book. Probably one of the best books ever written on finance, actually, uh, The Psychology of Money. But previously, Morgan Housel was at The Motley Fool. And I remember reading this article back when I worked at The Motley Fool at the same time. And I remember, geez, that article could probably be summed up in one heading. That title alone was enough to change the way I think about investing. Um, and if we go right down his article from The Motley Fool, right down here, he said, in summary, a pilot once described his job as hours and hours of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. I think of investing the same way. Your success as an investor will be determined by how you respond to punctuated moments of terror, not the years and years spent on cruise control. Obviously, Morgan is a brilliant writer and articulates the message so well. And if you think about it, most of what we do as long-term investors is actually just letting the investments do, the, do their thing. And we've covered it in the past, but the reason why the stock market tends to go up over the long term, aside from all the philosophical reasons, is actually because the profits of companies tend to rise. Remember, we looked at this over 150 years. The stock market's profits as a whole tend to rise between 6 and 7% per annum. Some years they go down. In fact, there was one period, I think it was in the 70s, when profits went down three years in a row, but that's very rare. Um, but as a whole, the stock market tends to get more valuable because companies tend to make bigger profits. 
And if you go back to it, well, why do they make bigger profits? Well, it's because they tend to solve bigger and bigger problems. And so that is the essence of long-term investing. And that's why it works. And that's why the fewer decisions you make, typically the better the outcomes. That's one of the wonders of ETFs is you know which ETFs you want and you can just slowly add to them. And then you can also add some individual stocks if you want that too. But definitely, you know, I did a study on this, a very ad hoc study when I was a, a researcher and um, I found that the fund managers, so the professional investors who made fewer decisions, had smaller portfolios in terms of the number of companies that they owned, tended to do much better. Related study, women tend to be better investors as well. Um, so if you're a female that tends to make fewer decisions, maybe they're intertwined, maybe causation and correlation, uh, maybe you're ahead of the pack already. Uh, oh, and you've said the secret of getting ahead is getting started. That's fantastic, Mark Twain quote. Wonderful. Um, okay, so uh, do, 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 do. Uh, SRT, I try and look at my portfolio manager share site to give my, my perspective. The pecky, specky stocks I initially bought have all done terribly. It reminds me not to buy more. <laughs> uh, SRT, thanks for jumping in the chat too. Um, I think that's incredible. So once I developed some investing rules and goals, the total return on ETFs and quality stocks have actually done okay, despite the volatility issue. That's fantastic. Um, that's wonderful. Uh, Rajan, you said, I was listening to another podcast where they were saying to stay away from ETFs. What are your thoughts, Owen? Rajan, thank you for that comment. Um, happy to answer it. Uh, I think there are some things, and I had this debate in person last week at the ASA conference. There are some ETFs which are not great. Like, let's be honest. But many of the ETFs that are pretty popular and well-established um, are very well regulated, are diversified, uh, and they don't really have any of the big risks, at least from what I can see, that so many um, of the so-called experts throw at them. So, like, there are two. There's it basically boils down to this, Rajan. Like, ETFs are extremely popular. ETFs have survived a few market crises, uh, but ETFs do depend on a few organizations, like the ETF provider. There's a thing called the market maker in between the stock exchange. All of these things kind of operating efficiently. But one way to de-risk this process is to actually just focus on the ETFs that are what we call liquid. This means that the big ETFs that invest in shares and bonds tend to be relatively safe from an investment construction perspective. It's really those niche ETFs that tend to get a bit uh, strange. Um I can go into more detail, but there's a fantastic thing online. If you just Google uh, beta shares and you Google ETF bubble, there's a podcast we did, Rajan, where we talked about this. So, um, yeah, uh, providing some great value, Owen, on my commute home, Roy. Well, thank you. Wonderful. Um, how was the conference, Owen? Anyone from, up from the community coming up with some hard questions? Yeah, there were some hard questions. I can tell you that. There's always hard questions in the ASA community, but it's great. It's really good. Uh, Jenny, my long-term investments, IVV, Sol, VAS, and VTS. I know IVV and VTS are similar, but don't care. Ah, good on you. Good on you, Jenny. Fantastic. Okay. So I'm not sure if any of you have read, this is a total change uh, of tact. I'm not sure if any of you have read this book, and I'll just turn off my share screen. This book, Sapiens uh, by Yuval Harari. Um, fantastic book. And on the back, this is what made me actually pick up the book and take it home, was this idea that 100,000 years ago, at least six human species inhabited the earth. Today, there is just one. And um, this, I mean, there's so many ways we could go with this, but I tend to view the world of investing as, you know, a long-term pursuit. But there are some things that change. Um, there are some things to, that change. And I think people tend to underestimate the time of the stock market and the time that it takes to build things. Um in particular, there was a, a, a passage of this book, which really informed the way I invest. And the, the passage talks about how if you think about what we do as a society and how we value companies and how we value things, it's actually all just a work of fiction. So, for example, we know not to go outside and to drive our car at 200 kilometers an hour. Uh, on a residential street. Now we know that because we believe it. There's no other reason why we don't do it. We could do it. So we, we could go out there and do that. I'm mean, obviously advising no one to do that, but we could do it. And it's the same thing that happened with people and with businesses and property rights many years ago. So, you know, we all believe that companies solve problems. And what are companies? Companies are just people who come together to solve a problem. So, 
Commonwealth Bank, maybe has 100,000 people working for that organization. They don't have to be there. They don't have to go there. They are kind of united by this common goal of solving a problem, even if they don't think it every day. And what this basically means is that in order to study companies, you need to understand people. And you need to understand that sometimes things will change, but you really need to start with the people first and foremost. And this is why I believe that you know, long-term investing, if you can find companies that have very strong cultures, going back to last week's episode, um, you'll tend to do well. And this is just a little thing that I've chucked in here for a bit of a, the science geeks like myself. I was chatting um, to uh, an educator uh, in spa- uh, who, who focuses on space technology last year. Uh, and he has this wonderful uh, podcast series that explores what alien life would look like. And one of the things that struck me from that, which is really odd, and I just put this in here just as an aside for those space geeks like me, is that I think it's more likely the aliens we interact with will be artificial intelligence, not biological. And in fact, if another species interacts with us, <laughs> the human beings, they probably won't interact with us as people. They'll probably just be interacting with uh, an artificially intelligent version of ourselves. And I think that's a, something that I just boggled my mind and I've had a very long time to try and wrap my head around that because at the end of the day, you know, 20 years from now, why would we be sending ourselves into space, uh, Elon Musk, when we can send something else to do it for us? I just think that's really interesting. Um, okay, so Sapiens is my favorite ever. Oh, Rob, that's fantastic. Most gifted at least. Fantastic. Why, why is it, um, Why is that so, Rob? I'd love to know. Okay, so moving on from this little fun one this is where um my my good friend and um co-host of my podcast of our podcast series so the australian investors podcast not my podcast, our podcast series the australian investors podcast comes in and this is something that's only been impressed upon me the last year or two but drew has this fantastic view of how you should build your wealth and he says we don't try and prepare our wealth for a certain future we try to prepare ourselves for any future um, and it's this idea that when we build something, so if you invest in the IVV ETF or you invest in, I don't know, the VAS ETF, the important thing is that you don't get ahead of yourself and overcomplicate it by trying to be too smart. Imagine that not one thing goes wrong, but all of those go wrong. How would you build a portfolio? Build your portfolio to be able to withstand any future. And this is this idea of, you know, the all weather portfolio, which we talked about a little while ago. We never know for certain what the future was, would hold, but we get pretty close. Um, Aaron, you've got Ant, uh, Nassim Taleb. Actually, Aaron, it's a fantastic, you're very close to this idea, uh, this idea of anti-fragile. But Aaron, last week, we actually talked about Nassim Taleb's uh, work in a roundabout way because we talked about anti-fragile companies last week. Uh, and we talked about why these are such, there are certain companies that are what Nassim Taleb might say is are anti-fragile. Um, and so I'd highly encourage you to go check, uh, check that out. Uh, another 1.5 hour episode tonight, A. Owen. Not really, Jeremy. I'm actually on my last slide. So we're almost there. Why Sapien says, Rob, um, he says, I, li- I like a bit of history and I was impressed by how cogent he made it. Also fun points to the origin of money. Yes, indeed, indeed. I think it's a fantastic. But one of Sapiens is one of the most recommend was was one of the one of the most recommended books that um, was recommended to me, which is funny because it's a totally it's not about investing at all. But a lot of investors recommended this book to me, and they also recommend Super Forecasting as well. If you if you're familiar with that book, I finally got around to reading them. Okay, finally one more quote. And actually, this is a repeat. So you may be able to guess who this is. I brought this up before. Past a certain level of income, what you need is just what sits below your ego. Think of it like this. And one of the most powerful ways to increase your savings isn't to raise your income. It's to raise your humility. So if anyone knows where this is from, fantastic. If not, um, this one is actually from Morgan Housel as well. And it actually was one of the things that he spoke about in a blog post that got I think it got downloaded 2 million times. Like there was a PDF of it, got downloaded 2 million times. And that's basically the only reason why he wrote the book. He always talked about like he would never write a book. And then his PDF, which had some of these things in it, got downloaded 2 million times. And he thinks, well, maybe uh, maybe I should do that book after all. Uh, and so that's where this comes from. Okay. So that was actually my last um, my last slide for tonight. And I'm so glad that we've got through the slides because as you know, I don't 
love the slides uh, as much as I do, do love talking. Simon, you've said I recommend start with why Simon Sinek. Fantastic book. Yes, indeed. Um, okay. So I, uh, I've got some time for some questions, but one question that came through in advance on Twitter uh, was this idea of should you just use VDHG, the ETF, or should you roll your own? Uh, and there's a great blog post on this. SLT you might be able to tell me who it was. I think it was Passive Investing Australia as a blogger who wrote about VDHG versus creating your own ETF portfolio. Many of you will know that VDHG is an ETF that invests in other uh, funds. So you can invest in this one thing and then you get exposure to many different things. Um, and you may also remember that we had Balaji on the show. Uh, if we go back, we had Balaji on the show, uh, this one right here. And he, his company is obviously, or organization is the, the creator of these ETFs. And as he said in there, he, he pointed out how they're built, why they're built, and so on and so forth. And I have a lot of discussion with my um, with my peers in the industry about this. And I think for most people, to be honest, for most people, an off-the-shelf ETF from Vanguard is fine. For most people, that's fine. Um, you know it's going to be low cost. You know it's going to be effectively managed because Vanguard has the track record for that. Now, that's most people. It's not everyone. Some people want to do more. Some people like to buy individual shares. Some people like to make their own ETFs. But what I would say is that if you do go down that path, like I do, is just be prepared that it's not a simple decision that it's just not a decision that should necessarily take lightly. You can create a core portfolio using just one of those diversified ETFs, or you can create a core portfolio making your own ETFs or shares, as some people were saying tonight. But uh, as so Jenny says, I dollar cost average into VDHG for my kids. See, that's really interesting, Jenny, because you also said before, I believe, that you use other things for your core portfolio yourself. So that's a, another great thing about these off-the-shelf options is that you can use them for kids or grandkids or whatever. Um, before VDHG and all that came along, I did use a Vanguard ETF for my little sister. Um, and they're, they're, they're an option that's like an 80% is, you know, 80-20. Like it's, it's good enough for most people, but if you want to go a few extra yards maybe you can put in a bit more effort and you can get a, a return or a portfolio that's more suited to your situation. But I think that's why these ETFs have been so popular. And every month when you look at the ASX data, what you can see is, if I'm going off a few months ago data, by the way, um, the average investment size into VDHG was $4,000, right? So $4,000. Now, some other ETFs, the average investment size is closer to I think it's like $80,000. And it, what it tells you is that some ETFs are more used by financial advisors and um, people in the industry to buy and build a portfolio. And some ETFs like VDHG are just for everyday investors looking just for long-term investing. And I think that's a really good um, way to think about where it can be used. Um, <laughs> I don't think I've, I've dropped this one here before, says Rob. So a reminder that everything in here constitutes general financial advice only. Yes, it's a great point, Rob. Um, obviously, we don't know everyone's situations. Um, so that's that's great. Um, how do you consume all these great books? I mean, how do you... Uh, is it uh, embedded in your day-to-day? -day? So free roaming, that's a great question. Um, it's what I ask a lot of other people when I speak to them. So... With many of the books, in fact, The Psychology of Money was the first audio book I ever listened to because I couldn't read as fast as I wanted to. Some people read really fast and I can't. But I, for about five or 10 years, uh, free roaming, in fact, I was probably closer to 10 years, I took two hours, hours out of my day, basically every day, to read books or to read financial information, whether I was studying or whatnot. In fact, I would walk. I've told people this before. I would walk. Like even on my commute, obviously I'd read and I'm not a big reader, right? And I don't come from a family of big readers, but I would read my book and I would walk from the bus or from the train to the office with the book like this. And I would walk into polls. I'd walk into things, not advisable, but uh, I would do that um, just so I could consume some more information. Now, obviously there are other ways people get pleasure out of reading books. I don't so much. I do it for the... Uh, 
uh, information, not so much the entertainment, but uh, that would be one thing. Um, and since the advent of audiobooks, I do that too. But I would also um, listen to investing books or podcasts and I would take notes, even if I was in the gym, uh, I would do the, the notes between the, the shows. So um, that's just one way. Uh, and otherwise, I think one of the things that is really important when it comes to reading, investing books or finance books is to be prepared to pick up the book and to get a few pages in and say, don't need to finish it. Um, that's something that took me a long time to get my head around. I always thought that if you picked up a book, you had to finish it. Um, and that's a principle from Chiel, Rob, Professor uh, Robert Cialdini, um, which is that you don't have to, basically. Uh, you don't have to do anything if you've, even if you've committed to it. Um, I was going to actually put that in my 10 tonight, but it was probably number 11. Um, but, yeah, I think just ramb rambling generally, uh, I think there are many ways to consume information. You've just got to crystallize it however it works for you. Um, so I can see uh, inter interesting. Most people prefer S and S and P 500 indices over VGS. I like VGS not only because of the world exposure, but how Miski reviews yearly developed markets that make up the world index. Saves having to do it. Great comment. So you're saying basically you prefer to invest globally in VGS rather than IVV. Um, yeah, free roaming. Thanks for answering. No worries. That's why I'm here. Absolutely, I love it. So um, just. Get just get chat GPT to dot point it for you, says Michael. Yeah, I know. We could just do that for everything. Um, so Simon, I'll just answer a couple more questions, guys, and then I'll um, I'll move on. I've actually got another live show to go to, to tonight. I'm so humbled. My first ever pre presentation to the Ladies Finance Club. Um, so I'm super excited about that one. Um, Wednesday night doesn't stop. The fun doesn't stop. So uh, Simon, you've said uh, Glenn Stevens has said interest rates are likely to stay where they are. Uh, is it likely we will end up in a recession? Historically, what investments have performed best during a recession? So, I mean, great question. Um, great question. So, um, I think if you look, I, I don't have the answer to your question, by the way. But what I'll do is I'll answer this generally. So, what investors typically are really good at doing is they're typically good at knowing what is interest, what is important to know now. So right now, we're thinking interest rates might go higher, even though people thought they might go lower. So that's kind of the thing right now. But that's a transient thing. And if you go back three, six, 12 months, the fear was inflation, right? But now inflation seems to be slowly getting under control. So now we'll worry about something else. Uh, and if you think about what professional investors are pretty good at doing, is they're pretty good at doing, well, we're here now. What's the next thing people are going to worry about? So most investors, professional investors, spend their time trying to predict what will go wrong or right in three to six months. Um, whereas most individual investors who just get caught up in the day-to-day -day are worried about here and now. And that's very easy to do because our emotions are anchored to the present. So we tend to be more emotive. Where professional investors will look forward a few months and try to uh, think about what, what's the next thing that people will worry about because that might inf influence my stock portfolio. And... Um, I was chatting to some professional investors uh, the other day and they, they, they were saying that by the end of the year, everyone will be most worried about, um, by the end of the year, everyone will be most worried about recession because the interest rates have gone up. People are going to start feeling the pain. So we'll focus on that narrative. We'll focus on the recession narrative. And so what I'm trying to get at is that at any one time, there's always something to worry about. And there's this old saying um, that, the stock market climbs the wall of worry, meaning that there's always something to worry about, but stocks tend to survive despite what it seems like is it's different this time. And so I would caution one just to go back and remember the facts that we talked about before. When your mind is consumed by fear, harder, Hans Rosling, to think about those facts. And the facts are that the stock market has performed exceptionally well over hundreds of years. Um, that people are still getting up every day, going to work at Commonwealth Bank and trying to lend more money um, and people are wanting to be employed and people are willing to pay someone else for a cup of coffee rather than make it themselves because they find value in that. So the barista will still be employed. And I think the more you can think like the fundamental nature of investing, the better off you'll be. Now to answer the second part, just briefly, I don't have the answer for which stocks perform best at any one time. 
But what I would say is that at any one time, I think the best thing to do is to invest in the best possible things that you could find. And if those are individual stocks, fantastic. If those are ETFs, fantastic. Um, that's that's how I've invested for 10 years and how I intend to keep investing. Um, so that's probably what I'd say. Um, so um, uh, what we've got, uh, Andrea, you've said, I'll be in the Ladies Finance Club webinar. Fantastic. I'll see you in about 25 minutes, Andrea. Um, Barry, you've said, Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize in Economic Scientists in 2002, reminds us to be humble. The idea that the future is unpredictable is undermined every day by the ease with which the past is explained. Absolutely, Barry. A fantastic quote from fantastic researcher and thinker. And obviously, Kahneman and Tversky came up with so many great papers. But one of the things that he often says, uh, Daniel Kahneman, is this idea that even though our minds are a bit of a playground, um, no matter what we do, we can never completely avoid the irrational thoughts that we have. And this is important to investors. But what we can do is we can try to understand them and know when they're taking their toll on us. Uh, and if you are like me, uh, one of those people who do like to read really high quality content and want to get better at sharpening your mind, this is still, I believe, the best website on the internet, um, besides self-wealth, of course, Rob. Uh, and this, this website is by a guy called Shane Parrish. Um, and this is a, a fantastic website that you can learn so much from about yourself and about investing. So there you go. Uh, there's the, uh, the link in the chat. Uh, have a bit of fun with that website. I'd love to know what you think next week. Uh, but anyway, I won't finish tonight with a quote because I gave you too many. Um, but know that we will be back next Wednesday at 6 p.m. And we will be having special guests on the show uh, in the next few weeks. And we're always open to your feedback. Um, as I think it was Jason pointed out, almost at 10,000 subscribers, Rob and the team at Self Wealth, congratulations on that. That's fantastic. Um, who's going to do the show if when no one dies? Is my, um, don't forget, you've got the, uh, hopefully I'm not going to die, but we've got the, uh, we've got the, the link in the, the video description there to do that 10 things activity. I think if you, you don't even need to download it if you don't want to. You just got three columns, the, the 10 things that bring you joy the 10 things that you spend the most time on and the 10 things that, um, you know, uh, you spend the most money on and just draw a line between them and see what matches up and what doesn't. It's a great way to figure out why you're investing. Uh, I actually do something similar when I talk to small businesses as I say, actually, let's just stop this conversation and just show me your calendar from last week. Where are you spending the most time? Because if you're in a crisis in your business, I, I could probably find out why by looking at your calendar. Um, fantastic. Thank you, everyone, to um, who came along tonight. And uh, thank you if you have subscribed. That's wonderful. Um, Rob, always a pleasure dealing with you and uh, the, the community here tonight. So thank you, guys. Uh, if you are in the Ladies Finance Club uh, webinar in a few minutes, I'll see you then. But uh, next week, we're back. Um, we'll be back with more interesting stuff. And thank you for coming along tonight to a more theoretical session of Self-Wealth Live. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you next week.